what I have to talk about is a, a profound transformation of the human cultural niche, which took place over the end of the Pleistocene and the beginning of the Holocene periods in parts of Southwest Asia. Mobile forager groups changed to become permanently sed sedentary communities living in large numbers in fixed settlements. Yeah? And what is really of, of interest and something I want to emphasize is that from the beginning, they were using architecture and a careful design of the built environment to show how they intended to, how they were operating their community, their new community life. But there's two strands which we can uh, need to add into the picture, which go back much earlier. First of all, we're going back to a million years ago, before Homo sapiens, before Neanderthals. Uh, uh, the first time that we can see that humans were using fire, yeah, and they were using fire to uh, cook uh, and to to uh, sit around their fire, but they're also uh, eating together. It becomes an important focus of of life. They're bringing home their hunted prey. They're bringing home their collected food, they're uh, repairing their flint tools and all these sorts of things, all are, and cooking and looking after the baby all around the fire. It becomes a, a, a focus of, of uh, uh, social life. Then at around 450,000 years ago, we see the first um, uh, hearths appearing in uh, the mouths of caves and rock shelters, like the one you see on the screen here. Uh, and uh, those fireplaces are repeatedly ripped uh, built in the same place. So when they come back to the to, to reoccupy that site, they light the fire in the same place. It's something that becomes a, a fixed point in their community life as a little mobile forager group. As the authors in Steve Kuhn and Mary Steiner in this piece uh, uh, point out, this was, a, a, they say, a profound reorganization of the socioeconomics of daily life. We're going to jump forward now to about 100,000 years ago, and then the second element comes in, and that is um, we begin to see, particularly in, in the Levant, in, in the north of Israel, uh, cave sites where both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens start to bury a member of their group in the floor of the cave, yeah, in a burial under the floor of the cave. Yeah? This one's a Homo sapiens burial from the cave of Eshkul, just behind Tel Aviv. To understand why the developments move on from there, it's worth having a look at the at the map. There's a strip of land, an arc of land, starting in the south here at Jordan, Israel, going up through West Syria, going on through southeast Turkey, across northern Iraq, and then down the Iraq-Iran frontier, uh, which is particularly a um, good place for hunter-gatherers to operate. Yeah, It's an open forest land and grassland, it's the medium blue on this rainfall map. Yeah, it's uh, um, it supports a very wide variety of animals and and plants, which are very very attractive to to hunter gatherers, and that's where the, everything begins to happen. If we look at a, a reconstructed map of where wild wheat and wild barley uh, uh, and uh, were were native, it follows that arc, as you can see. If we look at the map of the distribution reconstructed distribution of of, of wild sheep, again, it follows that arc quite closely, yeah? And then similarly for wild goat, yeah? Uh, the number of other animals, gazelle, deer, all sorts. There's a whole variety of, of plant foods and animals to, to hunt. The plant foods include those cereals and they also include legumes like peas and beans and lentils and chickpeas, all of which are A, very nutritious, B, highly storable. You can harvest them store them, process them, and eat them over time, yeah? Around 20, 24,000 years ago, the lake level of the Sea of Galilee was a bit lower than it is today. And um, recently, back in the 19, like, late 1990s, the water level of the current Sea of Galilee was lowered artificially a little bit more than usual, and suddenly an archaeological site was exposed on the shoreline, yeah? The Israeli archaeologists jumped in with a quick excavation to see what was going on. And one of the things they're doing in this picture is they've set up their flotation so that they can flush out of the sediments all the plant remains from this site uh, uh, easily. And there were extraordinary variety of plant remains in that from that submerged site. Come back to that in a minute. Here's a plan of, of part of the excavation. The little green blobs are, in fact, 
the huts. Let's have a look at the, what some of them look like. Up in the top middle of this uh, photograph, there's a couple of grey discs. That's the floors of huts. Yeah. You can see a darker rim around that, which is the, the, where the uh, wall of the hut made of wood uh, was was stuck into the ground. Yeah. They show us little dark discs because they were repeatedly used, repeatedly swept out and cleaned, and they became slightly hollow floors. At the end of their lives, these little huts weren't just abandoned and walked away from, they actually destroyed them with fire. They deliberately burnt them. Yeah? So at the end of their use life, they were committed to the fire. The dark patch at the lower right is their communal hearth. So there's a number of groups living in little huts, but they're sharing the pre preparation of food and sitting around the fire and eating, as we've seen. Yeah? And they're using a whole variety of wheat, barley, and all sorts of other grasses, uh, animals and fish and so forth that they can hunt. The archaeologists have, and botanists and zoologists have reconstructed the seasonality of all these things. When were these things available? And it comes out at 12 months in the year. There were people living at this site 20, 24,000 years ago at all seasons of the year. We can't be sure that they were living there 12 months of the year straight off. But over time, they were there throughout the whole year. It's a tendency towards uh, um, be becoming sedentary, staying in one place for quite a time. There's one of their huts reconstructed. You know, the very unprepossessing site. It's an aerial photograph of a, a large site in semi arid Jordan. The site's called Harana. For it's recently found and it's only under excavation now. That area of dark grey uh, is 22 hectares in extent, which is more than 30 football pitches. It's an enormous area. And the dark colour is flint, chipstone. There's so much chipstone debris on the surface that it appears like a a, a dark carpet on this uh, picture. But when the archaeologists excavate, they're finding that there's a, a stratigraphy of, of structures being rebuilt here repeatedly. What we've got here is a very large number of people coming from all around the area to live at this place for a period of time at a season when there's, there's a, just close by them, there's some seasonal wetlands. And, and when those seasonal wetlands are really wet, there's a great flush of plants and it's attractive to animals. And there's a lot of people coming here, and they like being together here. Yeah, so we're beginning to see at Ohalu two, and then at Farana four, people wanting to to stay in one place for quite a time, and be together in large in, in quite large numbers. We're coming down to about thirteen thousand years ago, cave site in the north of Israel, but now uh, around thirteen thousand, uh, two things are happening. First of all, the um, they're actually building structures to live in. They're, they're not just camping in the in the mouth of the cave. They have built structures to live in. Uh, and the second thing that uh, is happening is it's larger. It's expanding out of the cave mouth. These are larger groups of people living in built structures. And around them, there are all those uh, uh, things which are marked with a capital G are graves. Yeah, uh, And the ones which are uh, colored blue, incidentally, are where the body buried there was wearing uh, elaborate ornamentation. But I'm more interested in this one down the bottom right corner, G17, which was recently excavated. It was quite a deep pit cut into the rock um, and the bottom of the pit was, was paved and then three bodies are buried there. The grave is refilled. Sometime later, the grave is reopened halfway down and another body is inserted, fill it up again. And then finally, it's reopened just the top and three bodies are put in at the top of the grave. That implies that people knew about this, this, this grave over a period of time, over, over years and years, uh, and they went on adding to it. Yeah, so we're seeing elaboration of, of the importance of burial within the settlement in building social memory. There are some groups at this time, 13,000 uh, BCE, who are living in open settlements like this one, again in the north of Israel, uh, they're excavating a circular pit, drum-shaped pit, and then walling that with stone, uh, so that uh, and then erecting a wooden uh, structure and roof over that. Yeah. So what appears to us are, are these circles of, of the retaining stone walls of these structures. The one at the top left is the one I, I want to mention first. That one had a burial inserted under the floor of the house, and then the house was turned into a, a grave marker. Yeah. It's filled in. Uh, but with a marker in the center where the grave was. In other words, the burial and the house are becoming very closely associated. We move over to the one on the right. 
we get a reconstruction of that and we can see that that has been cut into the ground to get a level floor and it's a d-shaped building open all along one side it's quite different from the houses it's quite different from the houses because it has three halves in it at least yeah and it also has all sorts of things buried in it quite special things buried what was going on there i nobody knows we can't reconstruct but it's a building within their little settlement, which has a special purpose or a series of special purposes. Switching over to uh, Jordan, same sort of period, uh, uh, a similar site, circular walls, a bit retaining a, a semi-subterranean uh, structure. And you would expect that when this site is abandoned, it would show you where, how people had lived in it and, and around there would be the rubbish, the, the, the flint debris, the animal bones and so forth. Quite the reverse. What the archaeologists found was that this density map shows that almost everything they found was put back into those houses so that when those when that settlement was abandoned, they didn't just walk away. They actually went through some quite uh, deliberate activities to close the site down in a very um, significant way. These settlements were important to them. The structures were important to them. We're coming over the boundary now. We're now into the Holocene. We're now into the 10th millennium. BCE with about 9,200, 9,300. The site of Jerfel Afma is beside the river Euphrates in the north of Syria. Excavated as a rescue excavation by uh, a French archaeologist, Danielle Stordeur. Since the site had never been reoccupied, she was able to open up a considerable area. She found that the early, uh, earliest uh, uh, settlement there, uh, the houses were quite simple, circular stone structures. But look again, the hearth is shared. Yeah, They don't have individual hearths. They are sharing hearths, yeah? Uh, but what was quite unexpected in this site was, near the center of it, was this large subterranean building, yeah? Completely unexpected. They thought it was just an open area in the middle of the settlement, and then they discovered that there is this huge structure. We can focus in on it. It's actually seven meters in diameter. It's excavated three meters deep into the ground. And if you were um, uh, uh, wanting to dig this hole, it's about 100 15 cubic meters of, of soil to be removed. That's about the equivalent of making a, a, a swimming pool outside your house, but doing it by hand, yeah? So it's an enormous task. And then it's walled with stone. And as you can see, that there are these symmetrical pattern of doorless cells, yeah? The archaeologists found, uh, when they got down to the bottom of those, that these had been used for the storage of either barley or lentils. These people were not just storing large amounts of barley and lentils, the botanist has been able to reconstruct that they had already begun cultivating barley and lentils. And this is the communal store, because it's such a vast amount of space, for the whole settlement. Daniel Storder estimates the population at around 120, 150 people. So they're still living like mobile for, uh, foragers of many uh, centuries before and sharing. Uh, um, uh, but it's become much more difficult to, to, to do now. It requires an app an apparatus like this, yep, to do the communal store. And then, again, when this building was uh, uh, finished with, uh, it wasn't just abandoned. The roof supports, the timber roof supports were taken out and the roof was set on fire, but not before a decapitated female body was laid on the floor of the building and then the roof, the, the, the collapsing burnt roof fell in on it and then it's completely filled in. That building was the second in a series of five. There, there were three more buildings, one after another, replacing each other as these important central buildings for the settlement. Here's a quick view of the next one down the line. We're not got communal storage anymore. It's now a large circular building with a stone bench all the way around it. Yeah. We're going to have to jump forward. We're coming forward to about 7,000, 6,500 BC. Over the intervening period of 2,000 years, people have become more and more uh, concerned to cultivate. They began animal management. And by 7,000, 6,500 BC, 80, 90 percent of, of, of the food that they consume will have been produced by their own agriculture or their, their own herding of, of animals. Yeah? Over that time also, the number of settlements has grown in number. So the number of communities has grown in number and the average size of community has grown in, in size. And some of them, like this one, Chatalayuk in central Turkey, have become very large. This is 15 hectares in extent and was in, oper in, in use for around a thousand years. A successful community numbering many hundreds, possibly several thousand people 
uh, over uh, a, a thousand years of time. Yeah, we're looking at the houses. But you see now the houses are extremely densely packed. There's no um, access to buildings at ground floor level. There's no doorways into buildings. Access would be communication would be across the rooftops and down through trap doors and ladders into the houses. We can look down into a house which is being excavated here. Now we can see that at the right hand side of this building, there's very substantial storage. Now the house has become the basic unit rather than the whole community. Uh, uh, and it's uh, for, for uh, agricultural production and the storage of its of its produce. Yeah, the living room is the larger room on the left, and the excavators are giving us a nice human scale as to how big that room was. The fire and this is still important. Top left corner, you can see where the fire and the oven were for this house. Yeah, and then uh, other things would be important in these houses. Quite commonly, under the floor of the house, there were burials. They dug through the plaster floor and inserted a burial. And sometimes they repeated that. There are more burials. And, and again, it's quite conspicuous. The burials don't interfere with one another. In other words, people knew where the burial was. It was perhaps marked in the plaster floor so that when a new burial was put in, it doesn't interfere with one that's previously there. So they are continuing to, to uh, um, build social memory into the, into the house by burying uh, defunct members of their, of their uh, household. Interesting point, when uh, very recently the um, uh, scientists have, have uh, unraveled the DNA of all these skeletons, they found that the bodies buried in an individual house are not biologically linked. In other words, this is not a family that's buried there. Yeah? Who comes to be buried there and why they come from wherever they are living elsewhere in the site to be buried here, we don't know. It's part of the complex links uh, which, are, which uh, build community together. They're also replastering the walls of their house frequently, practically every year, with a white marl plaster. Sometimes, as in this case, there are painted designs on the plaster. Sometimes it's a scene, even. Yeah, uh, and they also decorate the walls with sometimes the, with skulls. In this case, this uh, household is very proud of the fact that on their walls there were they've fallen off, uh, but there were the skulls of three wild bulls. Yeah. Uh, attached to the to, to the walls, yeah. Were these a, mem a memorial of a, a, an amazing hunting exp successful hunting expedition, hunting wild cattle on the plain, or was it the mem memorial of an absolutely enormous feasting event when those animals have been killed? Yeah. Uh, but again, the part, the communal life of the the community life within the building is in some way commemorated. One of the things that uh, uh, archaeologists uh, uh, have found is that there's a huge number of burials, particularly in the later um, site, Neolithic sites, like Chatelier, uh, and its congenial, and this one, Jericho, which was dug in the 1950. Suddenly, we 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 learned that there were these detached skulls with facial features modelled in clay, and sometimes painted like this one. Yeah, those have become quite iconic. Yeah, uh, and we've gone on finding them in in various other sites. What is Quite interesting is that each community evolves its own burial ceremonies. This one comes from South Syria, a bit further north from Jericho, some way north. And in this one, they create a cemetery area in an open part of the settlement. It's a large circular area into which they will insert burials. And they started off by lining up a whole series of detached skulls, one, two, three, four, five of them there. Uh, uh, those are a kind of foundation deposit which starts the, the thing off. And then there's successive burials, one after another. And I've got a lovely picture of uh, um, the clutch of, of models and painted skulls from another similar cemetery area in another part of the same settlement. That was very distinctive of this particular settlement. Looking at the burials uh, from the uh, South Levant, from Israel, Jordan, Palestine, uh, it, the archaeologist Ian Kite has produced uh, uh, this uh, diagram, how the burial of an individual after death is, is returned to across the top of the scene that sometime later, after the body has decayed, the skull is removed from the burial very carefully, very easy, very neatly, without damaging the skeleton, Yeah, which again implies that people knew exactly where the grave was and exactly where to go for it to get the skull sometime later. yeah, That skull is then uh, curated and, and becomes a remembered person uh, uh, and over time, a symbolic person, 
the skulls come are, are, are brought together of several people and finally what we find are caches of buried skulls yeah and what ian is is uh, emphasizing with this diagram is that there are generations decades and decades centuries perhaps between the initial burial of, of, a, of a person and the final incorporation of that skull into a burial of, of, of the ancestors of the community. It's a long running process. So what I hope I've been able to show you is that the built environments that people created and their attention to the architecture formed an arena for social life in these new large permanent communities, which were very uh, self-sufficient and very uh, uh, long lasting. And it provided the means to construct the idea of community rooted in social memory. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm really sorry I wasn't able to be with you.